have a, I don't know, a wonderful message. Amen. <laughs> Thank you very much for those of you in faith anticipate that. But um, living without, living with a possibility mindset. All things are possible. Now, it, you know, people have to say, well, everything's possible. Well, me being a brain surgeon, that's not possible. Okay, I'm sorry, you know, you know. I may watch videos, but I don't think anybody's going to line up for me to give them, have them brain surgery, okay? But all things are possible in the sense that God has a plan for our life and a purpose. And what happens is we, we kind of shut the door on it because of our, pre, our upbringing or people we know, what people have said. And this is kind of what we spoke about last week. But the scripture text for today is in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, and I have a number of texts. But... The scripture says, Jesus said unto, the, unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. The uh, Message Bible says, Jesus said, If, there is no if among believers, anything can happen. <laughs> Which one of those versions do you like? If, <laughs> Jesus said, If, there's no if in the kingdom of God. So it's important to know that there are possibilities, and that nothing is off the plate, off the table, off of whatever God is leading us to in our future. Now, we know that there is positive thinking and positive attitude, and those, those are good, but what we're looking at here is how that God is at work in our life, and how that God, through his word, is going to make these texts real to us as a promise, as a possibility for our lifetime. So in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. So you see, there are no if in the kingdom of God. There is the, the plan and purpose of God. So there is this purpose that God has set out to do in us, and Paul is saying it's by knowing Christ. It's not, you know, some myth or some type of fantasy or some type of um, well-known remembering and having positive, pos again, positive attitude is good, you know. It, there are people who are already dead and they just haven't died. So, you know, their minds, their hearts, their whole way of thinking is, it's all over but the burial. Well, you know, that's about as far as they're going to get. But to those who have a faith and have a, a positive approach, it is that God has given us something to work forward to and to look forward to. I want to know Christ, to gain a proper, deeper knowledge of Christ. See, if I ask you to tell me, well, what, what do you know about Jesus? Well, you would start to quote the scriptures and start looking at the Gospels and seeing what Jesus did. So we know things about him. Well, what did Jesus say? What, did, what happened through, all, through his life and what purpose did he serve? He came to die for our sins. He came to bring about the reality of forgiveness that nothing would stand between me and God, between you and God. You see, sin is that which breaks the connection. Sin is that which causes us to fail in our relationship with God. Now, there isn't anybody who doesn't fail, so we're not, we're not looking for perfection, but we're not looking for excuses either. So to know the power of the resurrection of Jesus. So all things are possible to him who believes. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. So we're looking at how the God is going to work in our life. And the, the text last week was Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power. Important. I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. The emphasis here is not that Paul is not praying that we would receive that power. He's telling us you already have it. 
And so we have to be aware of that power that God has for us in our life. We have to be aware of it. It is there. It is part of who we are. It came whenever we accepted Christ as our Savior. Now, so we have to wake up in our spirit, in our mind, in our soul. We have to wake up and recognize the power is already there. Amen. Amen. I will give you... No, this is, this is not true. Don't do this, okay? If you take bobby pins, probably ladies don't even know what a bobby pin is to kids, you know. But if you take some metal object and stick it in a, in a light socket, you will know if there's power in there. Don't do that. <laughs> but you will know if there's power in there. And, you know, one time we were changing uh, lights in, uh, in the parsonage, uh, changing the light socket. And Brad was helping me, and we turned. He says, "Well, turn the power on, turn the switch on." So I turned it on. He said, "Turn it off." I forgot. He got jolted. <laughs> they said, you turn, turn that off. <laughs> well, we know when the power's on. Okay, so we are to realize the power is already there. We just have to allow it to become part of who we are. That's the kind of power the Apostle Paul wanted to experience when he realized he was helpless to overcome sin. He couldn't do it on his own. Human effort cannot stop sinning. That was the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the laws, don't do this, don't do that, all that kind of stuff, you know, do these services and all these things. And they, you know, it told them what was wrong, but it gave no power to keep them from sinning. So when Christ came as fulfillment of the law, he came to let us know, okay, these are the things that are wrong, but here is the strength and the power, and I'm putting it in you. Romans chapter 6, verse 4, kind of gives us the idea of what, what this is presented. For we died when we were buried with Christ in baptism. So when we receive Christ as our Savior, we are baptized. We are immersed in water and resurrected. It's, it's the understanding that I have died with Christ. My old self is gone. My new life is alive in Jesus. So we, we experience his resurrection power that keeps us day by day. That's where our hope, that's where our, <laughs> there are no ifs among believers because of the resurrected power of Jesus Christ. So nothing is off the table of what we can become. Now, it, you know, it, you're 15, whatever, nothing's off the table. You want to be a doctor? Well, you go in that direction. If you want, to, you want to do this, you just go in that direction. Now, old people like me, I'm not going to say what's up for me, but anyhow, <laughs> we have, there is a direction that God still wants to do in our life. Nothing is off the table. Because if you would ask me when I was 16, 17, 18, you know, you're going to stand up in front of people and you're going to speak, you're going to be on boards, you're going to do all this other stuff, I'd have said, that's off the table. <laughs> no way. But God has a way of bringing these things about in our life. And so the challenge is to recognize that the power is already in us. So to defeat the sin, we have to defeat our old nature. And our old nature is defeated through Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to look at something that's in the Old Testament in, in, in First Kings, Second Kings. Now, you say, well, what's, what's in Second Kings that's going to help me understand this? Well, let's look at Second Kings chapter 19. Well, I'll tell you what Second Kings 18 talks about. Sennacherib, he's the king of Persia. Now, we have to understand that these are true stories. These are not myths. Sennacherib is a real king who was the king of Persia, all right? Assyria, excuse me. He's the king of Assyria. They have found, archaeologically, they have found his temple, his palace, not his temple. They found his palace. And Sennacherib wrote documents. They put them on clay tablets or on some of these that are like stones and stuff. And they have found three different documents that he had had written about his accomplishments. And according to Sennacherib, in Assyria, in his palace, he has these documents that line up with 2 Kings 18. So this really did happen 
not just the Bible story. It is a true story, and archaeology has verified it. The king of um, Hezekiah of Jerusalem, his father has been paying tribute, paying money to King Sennacherib to not invade them, <clears throat> not destroy them, you know, to be at peace with them. So for Jerusalem to be at peace with Assyria, they had to pay money. Well, king decided not going to do that anymore. <laughs> they're, they're a thousand miles away. They're not going to worry about us over here in, in, in Israel and Palestine area. They're not going to worry about us. Well, he was mistaken. <laughs> so he declares that um, he's not going to pay, and Sennacherib decides, I'm going to pay those people a visit <laughs> with his, all of his armies. So when King Hezekiah, this is chapter 19, verse 1, when King, King Hezekiah heard their report, when the, let's say, the, the, the individual who came from um, Sennacherib comes to the city walls and he makes this announcement, we're going to destroy you, we're going to take, you know, you people don't have a prayer, the God that you serve isn't going to take care of you, you know, this, you're, you're lost, we're just going to destroy the whole place. Well, Hezekiah, he decides, well, maybe we should pay him money. So he pays them all this money, and, he sa and, 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 and Sennacherib says, thank you, we're still destroying you. <laughs> okay? So, well, when Hezekiah heard the report, he tore his clothes, he put on burlap, and, and he goes through this whole, whole scenario of, of, of repentance and things before God. And this is what the king says to, um, today is the day of trouble. He sends this message to, to the prophet Isaiah. Today is a day of trouble, insults, and disgrace. It is like when a child is born, but the mother has no strength to deliver the baby. But perhaps the Lord your God has already heard the Assyrian chief of staff sent by the king to defy the living God and will punish him. So Hezekiah said, sends a message to Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, and he's, you know, maybe Isaiah can get God to do something for us. Because if God doesn't do something for us, we're dead. <laughs> so, um, so the prophet, verse 8, verse 6 says, The prophet replied, Isaiah replies, Say to your master, this is what the Lord says. So God tells Hezekiah, Do not be disturbed by this blasphemous speech against me from the Assyrian king's messenger. Listen, I myself, will move against him. And the king will receive a message that he is needed at home, so he will return to his land where I will have him killed with a sword. So Isaiah says, don't worry, I've talked to God. God says this is what's going to happen. He's, going to, he's not going to defeat you. Now, verse 9, Isaiah is speaking of the refugees. Now this is important, all right? except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. What's going on is the king of Assyria has come over, and in Israel it's divided. There's the northern ten tribes, and then there's Judah and Jerusalem. The northern ten tribes, um, they have been wiped out by the Assyrians. I think there's 46 cities that the Assyrians have conquered. So they've come through, and they've just killed everybody. And so they've wiped out all these people, and they've come now to Jerusalem, and they've set siege to Jerusalem. But there's, there's something going on. Whenever we, you see it, whenever, the, you know, in, in Africa and these different countries where, and in, in Europe, where there's war going on, the people, what do they do? They go to a safe place. Well, the refugees from the northern ten tribes... Of, of, of Israel. They flee to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, and it's referred to in the scriptures, Jerusalem is like an overcrowded sheep pen. <laughs> that refugees have crowded into the city and there's just, there's more people than there is room. And so the whole city is full of people and enclosed in, in, in these walls. So in 701, Sennacherib the Assyrian has now invaded Judah and he has destroyed 46 cities on his way. So he's pretty, he's pretty much mastered the idea of putting a siege on the people, building ramps to higher than their walls, and then climbing over the walls and killing all the people and, and taking them captive. 
So Sennacherib, this guy is mentioned more than 16 times in the Bible. And so in this, and, and I'm, what I'm doing is building the facts of what's happening, that this is not just a story. I've heard this story since I was a kid. You know, and, you know, okay, you know, we had all this, you know, but it was an actual event, just as real as the Battle of Gettysburg. This battle is just as real as, you know, go to the bat battlefield in Gettysburg. Well, you can go to this, to Jerusalem, you can go to these cities, and you can still see the cities that were destroyed by uh, Sennacherib. So, so um, he's like most kings. He's very, he's very boastful. He considers himself um, you know, better than everybody else. He builds himself a palace, and his palace is, has no rival. <laughs> Probably it seems to be even greater than, than Solomon's palace. And so he is an historical figure he was a very successful conquering king, and he has destroyed the ten northern tribes. And we find that his, his um, records about his accomplishments are all written down. It's like the Egyptians. They have all these um, hieroglyphs on, on the walls of their uh, tombs and on their buildings, and they can tell you what happened where and who, who conquered whom, what Pharaoh did what to whom. They have all this stuff in these hieroglyphs and, in, you know, written on the walls, so it's etched in stone. <laughs> so this occasion that we're talking about here is etched in stone. So we find that uh, King Sennacherib decided to go and <laughs> teach these people a lesson. He besieged the city of the northern kingdom of Israel and, was, and had conquered them. The conquest is where the phrase, if you ever heard about it, the lost ten tribes of Israel. Well, what Sennacherib did to the northern kingdom, they figure wiped out all of the ten tribes of northern Israel. And that they were, they were no more, but not true. Because there was a remnant that came back down to Jerusalem. 2 Kings 18, verse 13. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah, and he took them. No one could stop the king. He was master at the siege, building the ramps, destroying the towns. So on his way to Jerusalem, everybody was laid waste, all the towns, cities, and again, they have, you know, you can, in archaeological digs and stuff, you can see the cities, and this is the city here, and this is the ramp that they built, and it's still there <laughs> for thousands of years. And so these refugees fled to Jerusalem. It's important that we live with a possibility mindset because King Hezekiah, what's he going to do? He calls on the prophet of God, Isaiah. What is Isaiah going to do? He's going to call upon God, see what God has to say. And Micah, chapter 2, verse 12, these are all texts about the same position, about the same battle, the same siege of Jerusalem. Michael, Micah says, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Bo Bozat, Bo Boaz, as the flock in the midst of their fold, they shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. <laughs> Basically what he's saying, the northern tribes have migrated down to Jerusalem for safety. Now, if Sennacherib destroys Jerusalem, there will be no promised Messiah. Because they'll all be dead. And there will be no remnant of Israel because they're all dead. But God says that he has a remnant, and Micah says, I brought them as a flock and put them in <laughs> inside the walls of Jerusalem, and they were like a, uh, a multitude of men, a no multitude of noisy men. I think should have put women in there. Multitude of noisy women. Just kidding. So... <laughs> The promised people would have had no promise. So, okay, what's the title of the message? 
don't have a limited mindset. The challenge for us is when things seem impossible, don't worry, they're not impossible. When something is so overwhelming and so large as a mighty army besieging the city, go to the prophet, go to the word of God. What is God saying about this situation? 2 Kings 19, verse 9. Soon afterward, King Sennacherib, he sent messengers back to Hezekiah to Jerusalem with his message. And this is his message, verse 10. This message is for the Hezekiah of Judah. Don't let your God in whom you trust deceive you. Did you ever have people criticize your faith? So here's this king who has wiped out 46 cities, comes to Jerusalem, and says to the king Hezekiah, don't let your God deceive you. With promises that Jerusalem will not um, will not be captured by the king of Assyria. You know perfectly well that the king of Assyria have done whatever he wanted, whatever they wanted, wherever they've gone, they've taken care of the cities. They have completely destroyed everyone who stood in their way. Why should you be any different? Have the gods of other nations rescued them? So Sennacherib is pretty confident that he and his god can conquer anything. See, this is the challenge. We have our faith. And sometimes difficulties, very extenuating difficulties come against us. The challenge for us is not to live with a limited mindset. What is God going to do in this situation? Well, after Hezekiah received the letter, he prays. And this is verse 15. O Lord, God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty cherubim. You alone are God of all kingdoms. So he starts by reminding himself. He's not reminding God. Okay, God, do you remember that you're the God of everybody and, you know, you have all... No, he's reminding himself about all the wonderful things God is, about all the wonderful things God has accomplished. Listen to Sennacherib's words of defiance against the living God. And so he goes through this whole prayer. And then here comes the promise. 2 Kings 19, verse 20. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent this message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Okay. The king is worried. We're going to be destroyed. Is God going to abandon us? So Isaiah, the prophet, sends this. I have heard your prayers and King Sennacherib of, of Assyria. The Lord has spoken this word against him. The virgin daughter of Zion despises you and laughs at you. <laughs> okay, this is Isaiah in the captured city. King's outside, the, you know, Sennacherib's outside with all of his armies, and he's telling the king, we're laughing at you. <laughs> we are laughing at your threats against us. Why? Because Isaiah has heard from God. You see, keeping a mindset that God is with me, keeping the mindset that I am more than a conqueror through Christ, keeping the understanding that God has promised never to leave me nor forsake me, keeping those promises in us can help us laugh at the enemy of our soul. When the enemy tries to bring discouragement, defeat, and, and all that kind of garbage, we need to recognize we have someone that is greater than that enemy. So Isaiah is telling them to, we're, gonna, we're laughing at you, Sennacherib. Then we move down to verse 25. Have you not heard? I decided this long ago. Isaiah is telling the king, Hezekiah, God had this planned out long ago. You know, I have plans for you, says the Lord. A future, a place, a perspective. God has a plan. Now, we have to realize God has a plan. Whenever we're talking about the power of God, we're not praying that the power of God would come to us. We're praying that we would understand the power of God's already in us. God has a plan. 
So they're saying, God has a plan. You knew all this was going to take place? Yeah. You see, the northern tribes had lived in rebellion against God, and they had all kinds of idols, and God used this as a punishment against them because they wouldn't turn from their wicked ways. So now it comes to the siege of Jerusalem, <laughs> and it's like the, the, the Isaiah is telling them, <laughs> God had a plan. This is his plan. So if God has a plan, it's already in place, the siege of the city is there. The remnant is there. God has a plan. God has a plan for your life. <laughs> Verse 27. But I know you well, where you stay. So this is God telling this to, you know, t speaking through the prophet. I know you well. I know where you stay and when you come and go. And I know the way you have raged against me. He's telling Sennacherib, I know all about you. There's nowhere you can go. I know you going in and going out. I know all about you. There's no, there's no um, blind side here coming, coming and besieging Jerusalem. And then verse 32. And this is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. His army will not enter Jerusalem. Okay. <laughs> this whole army is surrounding Jerusalem they're putting a siege, they're going to besiege the city and destroy it just like they've just done 46 other cities. His armies, and the prophet says, his army will not enter Jerusalem. The scripture says, it shall not come nigh your dwelling. That God shall watch over and protect you. That his blood it covers us, that it is, it is his protection and his love that evil cannot touch us. So if we open the door and go do evil things, that's different. But God, evil cannot just knock on the door and bu burst into our life. We have choices. And so his armies will not enter Jerusalem. They will not even shoot an arrow at it. I mean, there's, there's 200,000 soldiers out there. there you know, there's, there's 200,000, you know, they, whenever, these, whenever these armies come, they bring all of their servants, they bring all of their wealth, uh, they bring their herds, their cattle, their, you know, they bring it all because they got to live while they're on the road. They didn't have trains and planes and boats and all that kind of stuff. They had to live. The prophet says, they will not march outside its gates with their shields. They're not even going to get close enough for you to look at them with their shields. Nor build barracks of earth against this wall. They're not going to build those ramps. They're not going to shoot an arrow. They're not going to march around the city. They're not, you're not going to see their shields, and they're not going to build a ramp. The king will return to his own country. Sennacherib's going home. By the same road in which he came, he will not enter the city, says the Lord. For my own honor and for the sake of my servant David, I will defend this city and protect it. For God's sake of who he is in your life, he will protect you. He will provide for you. He will make a way for you where there is no way. But we have to understand that Christ is our Savior. If we're not, don't have Christ in our heart, this doesn't mean anything. Because without Jesus in us, nothing works. It's not magic. It's not waving this around like a wand and say, oh, this is magic. God is in me. Nope. It is God's word living, abiding in us because we have asked him to forgive us and, al and abide within us. Now, sounds pretty good, doesn't it? They're not going to get close. They're not going to build ramps. They're not going to shoot an arrow. It sounds wonderful. Verse 35. That night, the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 soldiers. This is not a fairy tale. This is, Sennacherib himself writes about this siege in his own documents and says, I caged up Jerusalem. But he doesn't say he defeated it. He says he left it. And so the 185,000 soldiers died in one night by the angel of the Lord. Take the limits off of God. What are the things that God can't do in our life? The challenge is for us to open up and receive what God's blessings are. And so what happens is 185,000 soldiers died, and when they woke up the next morning, they saw the corpses everywhere, 
and Sennacherib of Syria broke camp and returned to his own land. Just as the prophet had said. And then Isaiah puts a little uh, addendum on the end and says, he'll go there and he'll be killed uh, by the sword. What happens is, this is truth, this is in the records, um, Sennacherib goes home, he doesn't turn to the God of Israel, he returns to his own gods. While he is worshiping in his, in his temple, well, before he went into his temple, he appointed his younger son to be his heir, his king, the king to follow him. And the two older brothers were... <laughs> so they got mad at the king. They went in and killed their father in the temple of his gods. They ravaged the city and fled for their life, just as the prophet had said. So we find that the Bible is historically reliable... The angel of the Lord came and 185,000 people, soldiers, died in one night. And when God says to us that we should open our hearts, that we should allow the, the God, now I know, well, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. This is something that is real for us when we accept Christ as our Savior. Just as real as 185,000 soldiers dying. Just as real as God protected the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, because the refugees from the northern tribes came and found shelter and found um, safety within the walls of Jerusalem. But there, <laughs> the king Sennacherib says, no, we're going to kill them all. God says, not so. I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. So sometimes when reading these things, <laughs> we think they're just stories. Some say they're myths, fireside tales, but they are very real stories, events that took place, documented in the scriptures, documented in history, written down by King Sennacherib and his scribes in the city of Nineveh. All of these things are documented, and we can believe the word of God for our life. Don't put God in a box. No matter what is on the outside pressing around us, God has a way. Ephesians 3.20 Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish, uh, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Possibility thinking. Breaking, off, breaking out of the barriers of the things we put in our lives because there are there's an army surrounding my camp. There are problems that are surrounding my life. God says, I have a plan. Do you want to know the power that resides in you when you accept me as your Savior? God's promises are real. Can we live with an idea that all things are possible? Can we live with the idea that there are no ifs in the plan of God? Can we live knowing that God loves us more than we could ever imagine? And he died for our sins that we might have this power living and residing in us if the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you. He will quicken your life. Realize we have a plan. We can pray just as Isaiah and said, you know, the king, he, he's going to go home the way he came. And when he gets home, they're going to kill him by the sword. Prophet knew that. Prophet knew that God would take care of Israel. 185,000 soldiers died. We don't know how God is going to move, but we do know this. He will move in our life when we pray, when we believe. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. There are no ifs among believers. So God... <laughs> God, we bring ourselves. We bring our problems. God, we bring our needs to you. We feel like we're under attack. We feel like we're surrounded. Sometimes we feel like there's no way out. But God has a plan. He will send his spirit and destroy the enemy. He will heal our bodies. 
He will restore what has been stolen. He will provide a plan. And the problem, the situation will be destroyed (laughs) and we will see it no longer. God, we thank you for (laughs) your power that resides within us. Help us, O Lord, to see and receive what's already there and allow that power to work within us. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen? Take the limits off of God. (laughs) There are no problems. There are no ifs. There are just possibilities. And what is the song they used to sing as kids? I am a promise. I am a possibility. You shut this off, right? (laughs) I, I am a promise. I am a possibility.